Oh, I'm muted. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, great, great. Um, so, yeah, so uh, I'm actually not going to be talking about spin liquids. I'll be talking about superconductivity. Um, and I'm, I'm asking, going to ask the question, you know, can neural networks capture superconducting order um, uh, without really any information that the state is, is going to be superconducting? So we're going to try to start from sort of a bare bones neural network onset and see if we can stabilize superconductivity um, of various types. Um, I'm going to be doing, uh, showing calculations from variation of Monte Carlo. Um, there's been several really nice introductions to it already, so I'm going to skip that part. Um, but I do want to talk a little bit about my wave function, or our wave function onsets, which are these um, hidden fermion determinant states. Um, and actually, um, I'm going to add some, some lattice symmetries to these, to these states. Uh, and uh, I'm going to show some benchmarks on the uh, half-failed Hubbard model. Um, so this is a this is a model that's that's pretty well understood actually, and there's there's some uh, nearly exact results on on this predictor system. So it's a great great way to benchmark your your calculations. And then I'm going to discuss uh, the attractive Hubbard model, um, where we're expected to find S-wave superconductivity, and in fact we do stabilize it. Um, and then I will eventually move to the uh, repulsive Hubbard model, um, which describes cuprate superconductors. Um, uh, and, and show that it, we do actually see this D-wave superconductivity. Um, so, yeah, so, so let me start with this hidden Fermi approach, which is, which is what I'll use. Um, this is sort of an extension of, of uh, a Slater-Jastro method. So the idea of Slater-Jastro method is you have sort of a uh, some mean field orbitals for, for your electrons. So you have one orbital for every site. Um, and every, in this case, we have spin up and spin down. Um, and so uh, you, you take some determinant over those orbitals, um, but um, in, in this configuration, we actually also have these auxiliary orbitals, um, and these auxiliary orbitals are, are output uh, by a neural network. Um, and so what you end up having is you, your wave function is the determinant of some matrix. The kind of top half of the matrix um, are these, are these uh, mean field orbitals, and then the bottom half are actually output by, by a, uh, a, a neural network. Um, and so um, this, again, this, as I said before, it's an extension of this, this Slater-Jastro approach. Um, and um, actually, if you expand out the determinant this way, um, as a uh, product of determinants, you can see that actually the, the second, the first term is just the sort of the Slater part of the onsets, and the second term is, is this Jastro factor. But you can see this Jastro factor is actually informed um, by, the, uh, by the mean field uh, configurations. So you have this sort of interaction between your neural network orbitals um, and your mean field orbitals, which, is, which, which gives you this really, really rich um, expressibility. Uh, expressive power, um, and um, this. Uh, the, so what's what's great about this method is actually that um, this uh, mean field part of the, the wave function can be um, uh, computed very efficiently for um, the ratio of these of this of this part can be efficiently computed for for single fermion hoppings. Um, this is this is known as a low rank update uh, to the determinant, and so um, this this can uh, is very efficient. Um, uh, and actually makes it probably more efficient than backflow in some ways, um, which is a sort of competing, competing method. Um, uh, I will say that uh, I, did, I do not, um, I, I, I don't do the, these low rank updates for the, the simulations I'm showing, so, uh, you know, uh, the, that the cluster, I won't scale up the huge cluster sizes, but um, just know that um, these can be improved a bit and, and I can kind of go do bigger clusters in the future, I think, so. Um, so, so yeah, so, so why add symmetries to, to, to this, this hidden fermion state? Um, the main idea of, of adding symmetries um, in, a, in a sort of variational problem is actually you can, um, you want to take your Hilbert space um, and you want to divide it up into pieces. So symmetries, what they give you is they give you good quantum numbers. Um, so here we, uh, we have, a, if we have a Hamiltonian defined in a lattice, say, we have rotational symmetry, we have translational symmetry, we have reflection symmetry, um, and these quantum numbers, um, divide your Hilbert space up into pieces, and it, it, it makes the sort of search space for the ground state a lot easier. Um, and the other great thing is you can also find uh, low-lying excited states um, that as long as sort of they have different quantum numbers, you can find these excited states. So uh, I'll be showing that this is a bit of a blessing and a curse because you have to try different quantum numbers to find the ground state. You often don't know what the quantum numbers are a priori. Um, but, um, but ultimately, it improves the variational accuracy by enough that I think the trade-off's worth it. Um, yeah, so 
the kind of the strategy here is to kind of start with all the symmetry, start as symmetric as possible, and then try breaking some symmetries and see and see what what happens with the wave function. Um, uh, so yeah, so this is kind of how we we add the, the symmetry to the hidden fermion approach, um, and this is like rather technical, and I think I'd rather discuss this mostly. Uh, offline if anyone's interested, but um, our, our neural network orbitals are now this thing called a group convolutional neural network. Um, and uh, we also have this, um, this kind of string we have to put, this, this uh, sign, this pi thing um, is a uh, fermion sign we have to put into our wave function. Um, and this is because if we define a uh, Hamiltonian um, as a, you know, if we define our Hamiltonian in Fox space, um, Basically, the the, Fox, the ordering of the fermions will will break uh, lattice symmetries, and so we kind of have to stick this uh, sign by hand back into the wave function if we have, if we have the Fox state. Um, but uh, this is generally how we do it, um, and I'm happy to discuss more. Um, but um, I really want to talk about the results because I'm excited about them. Um, and so uh, first, I'm going to talk about the uh, square lattice Hubbard model um, at half filling. So uh, this is the model right here. And uh, this is a paradigmatic uh, model in quantum many-body physics. Um, it's kind of the simplest model you can make of, of sort of a mod insulator or, or interactions among uh, electrons. Um, and so uh, basically there's this potential energy term which says that two electrons uh, don't like to share the same state. They interact repulsively. And then there's this kinetic energy term, uh, which is the term on the right with the T. Um, and that's just the, the sort of kinetic, the desire of the electrons to move around. Um, and so when we do this model, when we study the square lattice uh, Hubbard model at half filling, um, we can compare with this, this method known as auxiliary field quantum Monte Carlo. Um, this method doesn't have a sign problem, and so the results are, are, are somewhat exact. Um, they're sort of exact to statistical accuracy. Um, and what's, what's kind of great about this also is that there's this particle hole transformation um, that you can make on the, the fermion operators. Um, and uh, this actually maps you between the, the attractive um, and repulsive Hubbard models. Uh, and um, so, so we, can, we can kind of, even though these two models are the same in some sense at half filling, um, the, the ground state looks very, very different in the, in the space of, of, um, of fermions. Um, and so actually if you have a, a repulsive Hubbard model, right, the electrons are localized um, and you have this anti-ferromagnetic super exchange between the electrons, so they want to be anti-ferromagnetically ordered. Um, so you have this, this uh, anti-ferromagnetic mod insulator, but um, when you turn U from positive to negative, you actually get this, um, this charge density wave um, where the electrons are sort of paired at, paired at uh, every other site. Um, so, so even though the, the kind of, the, the model is the same, the physics is very different. Um, and so what we do, what we did actually was we, we um, we tried both this attractive and this repulsive Hubbard model, um, and uh, with, with, with our neural network approach and Barriage de Monte Carlo, um, and we compared our results with, with um, AFQMC, um, and we found that indeed our results are really, really accurate. I mean, on 16 sites, they're nearly exact, um, and then on 36 sites, uh, they're, they're pretty similar to AFQMC, um, and so of course, a 36 site, problem with the Hubbard model is the Hilbert, Hilbert space is still way bigger than, than anything you could do with ED, and we're, we're demonstrating nearly exact results here. Um, the other thing we find, though, is that it's actually easier to represent this uh, spin density wave, this, this mod insulator, than it is to represent this, this charge density wave. Um, and so, um, so, so actually, yeah, yeah. This is the ground state energy, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so these are the ground state energies, um, and uh, on a torus with with uh, periodic boundary conditions in both directions. And so everything I show is going to be on toruses, tori with uh, periodic boundary conditions. Um, so yeah. So anyway, so I just I also wanted to you know check to see if if we were kind of physically getting the same thing for the attractive and the repulsive Hubbard model. So um, these are some correlation functions here. Um, the so on the left-hand side, we're, we're, we're showing um, some correlation functions of the attractive Hubbard model. And on the right-hand side, we're showing correlation functions of the repulsive Hubbard model. Um, and these correlation functions also transform under this, this particle hole transformation. 
Um, and I mean, the, the main thing to take away from this plot is actually that they look exactly the same. So on the, on the top, we're kind of seeing these charge correlations, and we're seeing this sort of this uh, charge density wave for the, the, uh, the u equals minus 6. Uh, the, the, and then we're seeing the spin density wave for u equals plus 6. And then similarly for the um, superconducting, S wave superconducting correlations on the left and the um, what, I, what I call spin flip correlations on the right, which is just how they, they transform under these symmetries. So this is a really good check that actually um, we're getting the right results in the half field Hubbard model. Um, and so I think with this, uh, you know, armed with this, this knowledge, uh, it's, it's worth it to look at um, the, uh, uh, the, the whole dope models. So this is, um, so first we're going to look at the whole dope attractive Hubbard model. Um, so actually, in, you can see kind of in the previous slide, there's actually this kind of this, this degeneracy between this like charge order and this superconducting order. Um, and so actually doping the Hubbard model with holes, this attractive Hubbard model with holes, We'll, we'll split this degeneracy between the the, um, uh, the attract or the, the charge density wave and the superconducting order, and it'll favor superconductivity. So, so we expect to see superconductivity in this model. Um, one one kind of nice way to think about it is basically when when electrons share a site here, when you create a pair of electrons in a site, they have to form a singlet state. So they're kind of forced to for, form a singlet state by sharing a site. So when one of them hops away, they kind of stay in stay in this this singlet state. Um, and um, so, so what, what, we, what you can look for is this, this idea of off-diagonal long-range order, um, which is if you kind of create a Cooper pair um, at a site and then you know, destroy it infinitely far away, you expect this expectation value to, to sort of stay finite as you, as you move these, these Cooper pairs as far as possible away. Um, and um, this, is, this is associated with sort of breaking of, of particle number symmetry locally. Um, which is which is really the, the hallmark signature of a superconducting state. So we look at these plots of the whole dope Hubbard model. Um, we can see that that uh, they're blue. Um, so uh, what that means is that the, the superconducting order parameter you can see is 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 pretty large first of all, and then it's, that it's also you know persisting as you know all the way across the cluster. And I should say actually uh, that the the reason the center is white is just because I set that value to zero to, so that you can see the scale of the, the correlation functions. Um, but um, yeah, so you can see that basically there's not really, these, these plots aren't that, that exciting. They're just kind of, <laughs> they're blue plots. But it's, it shows that we have this, um, this S-wave superconducting, or long range superconducting order. Um, and it's already kind of stabilized on a 36 site cluster. Um, so, um, so we stabilized S-wave order, um, and now let's, let's talk about D-wave order, which is really the, the more sort of exciting and, and, and uh, interesting problem. Um, and so the, the repulsive Hubbard model is, is well known to um, describe the coup rates. Um, the, the left plot here is, is sort of a cartoon of the, the um, phase diagram of the coup rates. We have these two domes. We have this, one, this small dome with, on the left, which is electron doping and this sort of larger dome on the right, which is hole doping. Um, and actually, this, the, the, right, the right figure is from a recent paper that kind of combines AFQMC and DMRG. And um, uh, this paper, you know, they, they get a lot of things correct. So the, the two main things they get correct are, are sort of where the domes are located, the sort of fillings that, are, that, that, that are, um, allow for superconductivity, and then also that the, the hole doping dome is larger than, than the, the particle doping dome. So um, this, is, this is really, really, really exciting, this paper. And it basically shows that the Hubbard model is really, really describing the, the physics of the Cooper as well. Um, now, this, this paper uses these two, these two methods that are well, you know, much more established than, than, than deep neural networks. They use AFQMC and DMRG. Um, and this paper is uh, often termed a handshake um, between the two methods. And the idea is that. Uh, you know, DMRG is, AFQMC is, is, is a cheaper calculation, but it's uncontrolled and it suffers from, from this, this fermion sign problem. Um, whereas DMRG is, is, is a more expensive calculation, but um, it's accurate in some sense. Like if you, you know, if you extrapolate to infinite bond dimension. Um, so the idea is, you know, to use DMRG to sort of verify that AFQMC is working on smaller clusters. Um, you know, that the correlation functions look the same, that they have the same physics, and then maybe use AFQMC to get to bigger clusters. Um, and so that's, that was kind of the strategy employed by the, the, the paper I showed uh, before. Um, the question is, like, what, what, 
you know, how can neural, what ne can neural networks bring to this, to this, um, this story? Um, and um, really the, the kind of, uh, the argument for neural networks has been sort of that they can kind of cover these blind spots of DMRG. So DMRG is kind of a quasi 1D algorithm and it also, you know, also the, the matrix product states always have a finite correlation length. Um, and so like if, if, the, if the entanglement scaling is either, you know, um, super area law, like in, in some gapless spin liquids, um, or actually, which is less discussed, is just if the physics is really two-dimensional in the sense that there's kind of long correlation lengths in both dimensions, both of these cases are, are cases where, where DMRG might fail and we might even need neural networks to check DMRG. So we're kind of, uh, we're kind of checking DMRG, which is checking AFQMC in some sense, I think. Um, and um, the good news is that, you know, the NQS results really, really strongly agree with DMRG, actually. Um, uh, and I basically have, have kind of looked at different, different things and, and I haven't really been able to find a, a strong discrepancy between NQS and DMRG. Um, and so, yeah, first let me just show that we, uh, we stabilize this D-wave superconducting order um, in, in the repulsive Hubbard model. So um, we've, we've added, you know, there's a, there's a the coup rates tend to have this uh, T prime term, which is the next, next neighbor hopping as well. Um, and so we're, we're, kind of, we're kind of looking at typical parameters for the coup rates and we're, we're doping with about 20% holes. Um, and um, now I'm defining my pair creation operator differently. So the, um, now, now the pair creation operator acts in a bond, right? So this is kind of two, two electrons being entangled on a sing, in a singlet state um, that, are, that, that, that live at nearest neighbor sites. Um, and the kind of mechanism which they become entangled by is this, again, this anti-ferromagnetic super exchange interaction. And so I'm defining this kind of D-wave average pairing function as just um, averaging over, over this pairing function for the, for the uh, um, you know, adding the X, X component and subtracting the Y component um, because this is sort of the D-wave symmetry that's, that's seen in the coup rates. Um, and um, what we see basically is, again, this plotted blue. Um, and so, uh, although there's, there's still obviously some, some kind of structure in the plot, so it's, it, it's clear that, the, the, um, that we haven't quite gotten to big enough clusters, but, but we've gotten to 64 sites. Um, and that's about the limits without doing low rank updates. So we do see, we do see this D-wave superconducting order, which is you know, really exciting to see this with neural quantum states. Um, and, and kind of confirms what, what DMRG and AFQMC see, and also, you know, what's seen in real life. Um, so this is all great news. Um, yeah, so actually, so what I showed, what I showed you there was, was um, one-fifth one -fifth hole doping. Um, so I just want to confirm some, other, some of the other findings with DMRG. So the, um, the other thing you kind of see with the superconductivity is actually these spin stripes. Um, and these spin stripes are kind of, uh, thought to have some kind of relation, again, with this anti-ferromagnetic super exchange um, that, that's really causing the Cooper pairs to form. Um, so when, when to find these spin stripes, actually, we have to break a symmetry. So um, if you look at the left, that's what the actual ground state correlation, spin-spin correlation functions look, look like. Um, and so they're, 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 of course, they have to be symmetric because the ground state's symmetric. Um, but um, you can kind of break the symmetry at a very, very small energy cost, um, which is shown on the right here. Um, and, and when you break the symmetry, you in fact do see these, these superconducting stripes and the spin correlation functions. You can see kind of as you go vertically on that right plot that, that, that you see this, this kind of fluctu this, uh, fluctuation of up and down spins. Um, and actually, so, yeah. So my, my thought about why DMRG is actually working really well on this problem is actually that that um, these stripes, these stripes can kind of form with the, you know, the, the stripe pattern is a very short wavelength pattern. So even if there's some long wave, wavelength physics that's, that's stabilizing the superconductivity, the sort of short, the short wavelength physics, um, DMRG can kind of capture even if the, even if the clusters are, um, you know, not, not um, completely symmetric. Um, so, yeah, so this is what we see with the spin order and then again, the charge order we don't see much. Um, which is what's expected with DMRG. Um, now, um, here I'm plotting again the number of, you know, the number of electrons at a site times the number of electrons at a different site, displaced by some translation, you know, minus the the expectation value squared. Um, and so we don't really see much structure in, in sort of the way the, the the electrons are ordering. So again, 
there's, there's not really any charge ordering. We see this, we see this superconducting order seems to be the kind of strongest thing we see. Um, and um, yeah, so, um, so there's also this one eighth whole dope case. And so, so actually the green, the green here, I realize I never explained this, but <laughs> the green here is uh, the, uh, the charge, the charge, uh, sort of the charge. Um, so you can see the charge is pretty evenly distributed for the, um, or actually it's the whole density of the green. The green's the whole density. So you can see the whole density is pretty evenly distributed for the one-fifth state, which I just showed. Um, and then you have this one-eighth state where there's also some, some superconductivity. But the, um, the, you can look at the charge density and it's actually not, um, it's not uniform. It looks like there's kind of these um, ebbs and flows of the charge density. And so first we can look at the superconductivity. Um, and uh, what we find is actually a little strange. Uh, the superconductivity kind of um, only seems to form along one axis here with this, with this along the short axis. Um, this is a 32 site cluster, so it's actually already, I'm, I'm actually, the rotation symmetry is broken here already. Um, uh, and, um, the, but again, you see the superconductivity kind of is, is in line with this, these kind of spin, um, these spin fluctuations and the superconductivity that kind of match up together. Um, and uh, what's, what's going on in the x-direction? Um, so actually, we, we, if we look at the x-direction, um, we, we can look at the sort of charge-charge correlation functions, um, which don't really say, show much, actually. Um, and then what, what you can do is actually you can just break one of these symmetries. Um, and so if, if once you break a symmetry, the, um, you know, the, the charge is no longer uniformly distributed. If, you're, if you have the symmetry, it has to be sort of uniform on average. But when you break the symmetry, you can, you can break that. Um, so when we break the symmetry, we actually see these um, stripes here on the right. Um, and so this, again, is the, is the charge density wave that, that DMRG sees. Um, okay, so yeah, that's basically my talk. Um, the, yeah, I mean, the, the main thing is that we were able to stabilize these, these um, both S wave and, and, and D wave superconductivity. Um, uh, using neural quantum states, um, and and our findings really back DMRG, um, and you know the, the the kind of potential issues with DMRG seem to be avoided because these 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 spin stripes are kind of formed with a very short period, and so you don't really need a huge huge uh, you don't need a huge two dimensional cluster to really to really see the superconductivity in action. Thank you. Thank you. So we have time for questions. All right. Thanks. Uh, nice talk. Um, from the methodological um, point of view, I just have some questions with this, um, the hidden ansatz and the symmetries with respect mm -hmm. to, I mean, you made the statement in the beginning that it's um, more expressive than Slater just to, I mean, it's, of course, you can go beyond that with the backflow transformation. Now, with backflow transformations, the problem is that you can't really describe anything that is very, I mean, that is far away from uh, filled shells. So as long as, as soon as you have some uh, open shells, it basically doesn't really, it has a hard time representing those things. So I'm just wondering, you seem to be able to do any kind of doping, uh, unless you chose those in a specific way. I don't know how you came up with these numbers, but I'm just wondering, you seem to be having no problems with that. So do you think that would be due to the symmetries and the fact that you take into account all the rotational symmetries in your transformations as well? Or do you think it's rather because of the ansatz that you're choosing of the hidden fermions? Yeah, so, um, uh, so I, know, I know hidden fermions uh, improved upon backflow by, by a good bit um, when it came out. Um, but also the symmetries also improve upon hidden fermions. Um, and I, I mean, the symmetry is really, really helpful in small clusters. So, the, you know, the, because the, you know, the Hilbert space, you're cutting up the Hilbert space into pieces, which is really, really great when your Hilbert space isn't that, that large. But then as your Hilbert space gets larger and larger, these symmetries kind of become less and less effective in some sense. So I think symmetries are really, really doing a lot of work, especially on the small clusters with, with getting good, good variational energies, yeah. So you didn't look at, for example, the performance as a function of the doping specifically, whether whether this had an effect or 
No, I didn't, I didn't compare symmetries and no symmetries as a function of doping, no, no. I mean, I did compare it a few points, like, um, and, and no symmetry seems to, to work better. I mean, symmetry seems to work better, yeah. Just a curiosity, when you compared with the affiliate case in the Quantum Monte Carlo for mm -hmm. the six by six, uh, an order of magnitude of the parameters you used, just to have an idea. Uh, how many parameters did you have to, to optimize to get the, the energy you showed in the six by six? Oh, wow. Well, <laughs> um, I, I don't want the precise number, 10,000, 100,000, a million, just to know. Yeah, yeah. Let me just try to get a ballpark estimate, and uh, I think I think a hundred thousand about that order. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. Um, you said at the end that. Uh, um, here you, you, you don't get like so much different physics and DMRG because the superconductivity shows up already at short scale. Mm -hmm. So can you imagine any other systems where you might get qualitatively different results where that's not the case? Yeah, so I mean, I think one sort of example would be maybe like gapless spin liquids. They, you know, they have uh, long, or they, have, they really have infinite correlation length in, in both directions. So that's, that's a place where DMRG should absolutely completely fail. And, and actually, DMRG can kind of work if you're like really, really clever and like, you know, and like you know the answer already. And, and but, but, but I think it's a, I think that's a place where DMRG fails. I, in terms of superconductivity, um, yeah, that's something I'm, I'm interested in thinking about. If people have answers and the audience, that'd be amazing. I think. Thank you. So let's thank the speaker again. And, uh... <laughs>